I just thought I would take this opportunity to welcome all of you and to thank all of you for being here. We realize that, uh, and to thank you for ignoring these rather dire weather predictions that we've had of eight inches of, of plowable snow. So um, I don't think that's going to come to be, and I think that we'll uh, have a very wonderful day. But the weather notwithstanding, we all recognize that time is one of your most valuable assets, and we really do appreciate the time that you've dedicated to being with us today. And we're looking forward to a program that we hope uh, we'll provide you with the necessary information, as Dean Graham has suggested, um, to be not only an effective ambassador for the school, but also to be an informed spokesperson for the role that religion can and should play in um, the, the challenges of an increasingly complex society and an increasingly fractured society, as we, um, as we learned last night from Madeleine Albright's uh, many comments. Um, with that in mind, we've put together what we hope will be not only an enjoyable but informative program. And in order to provide you with as much information as possible, we've programmed ourselves extremely tightly. Um, but we do hope that, as was the case with our first session, that each time at uh, the conclusion of the panel, we have plenty of time to hear from you, to answer your questions, and to hear your insights on some of the things that we're about to talk about. So. We're almost ready to call up the panelists. That's all right. That's all right. Um, so my real role here today is to keep things rolling along because we have a very, very tight schedule. Um, our first panel um, is fo will focus on religious studies and global understanding, and we'll examine how the Divinity School's approach to the study of world religions provides a powerful perspective for religion and globalization. Our first moderator, uh, our, our first session will be moderated by uh, Ron Thiemann, so let me call Ron up. Ron is um, uh, the uh, familiar face to many of you, and he is the Bussey Professor of Theology. And for those of you who know, know Ron, you know that his, his scholarly focus and I dare say his passion is uh, examining things, the role that religion plays in the public life. Next, I'd like to introduce Ann Monius, Professor of South Asian Religions. Her area of specialization is in religious traditions of India. We're looking forward to hearing Anne's perspective on the role that religion plays in uh, one of the most, um, the, the, the very powerful and emerging economic and political superpower, in, uh, that being India. And finally, I'm, I'm pleased to introduce to you Don Swear, a man who wears many hats here at the school. He's a distinguished visiting professor of Buddhist studies, director of the Center uh, for the Study of World Religions, and Associate Deans for fac Dean for Faculty and Curricular Affairs. Ron, I'm going to turn it over to you to begin this morning's conversation. Thanks, Thank you. Bob. Uh, let me begin simply by saying what a delight it is for me to be here at this Leadership Council meeting. Last night felt a little bit like a reunion dinner with old friends, since I knew almost everyone in the room and count many of you as dear friends, so it's, it's a great honor to be here. I also think that um, having Derek Bach among us is a reminder um, of the greatness of, of his leadership. In my judgment, history will show that he is the most important um, person in American higher education since the Second World War in the second half of the 20th century. And I think you see not only in this wonderful self-deprecating humor, but in the vision that he has for the university and for the role that religion can play in the university, I think he stands um, in the forefront of, of leadership um, in higher education. We are under some serious time constraints, so I think each of us wants to be fairly brief so that we have an opportunity to get your response and to hear your questions. My role is to try to frame the discussion that we're going to have over the next 45 minutes to try to talk a little bit about the, the broad parameters of the importance of religion in public life. One of the things that struck me last night um, about Madeleine Albright's uh, presentation, particularly in the evening discussion after the dinner, was the way in which she openly admitted that her training as a political scientist required her to keep religion out of her analytic framework for working on questions of international relations. And that it was only when she reflected on the conflict in Northern Ireland and then she worked um, vigorously to bring about a peace process in the Middle East that she realized that for her own work and for the success of her work, she had to take religion quite seriously. 
And John Meacham mentioned that it was perhaps uh, the movie The Passion of the Christ that finally brought to the attention of the media the inescapable importance of religion in public affairs. But I think it's important to remember that there has been a series of events beginning really in the late 70s and early 80s which have made for the public, for the media, and for people in the university, though the university has probably lagged behind in this regard, has made it inescapable to recognize the importance of religion in public affairs. There was a remarkable period of about two years, about 24 months in the late 70s and early 80s, where there were events which began a process that has led to where we are today, the recognition of religion's importance. Let me just remind you of some of those events. In October of 1978, John Paul II was elevated to the papacy. In November of 1979, the Iran hostage crisis took place and the recognition that religion could have an enormous effect on public and international affairs. In 1980, the moral majority was founded and shortly thereafter, the presidential campaigns of Pat Robertson and Jesse Jackson. In 1981, the study process that was, lead, was to lead to the bishop's pastoral called the Challenge of Peace was established by the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops that led to that 1983 pastoral letter. So in a period of about 24 months, a set of international events which brought to the attention of a highly secularized academy and a highly secularized media the need to begin to understand the importance of religion both domestically and internationally. The next major uh, set of events were the 1989 revolutions in Eastern Europe, where in country after country, Poland and Hungary, the role of the Catholic Church. In East Germany, the role of the Lutheran churches. In Romania, the role of the Hungarian minority in bringing down that terrible regime. Again and again, it was seen that religion had a force in international affairs which could not be ignored. And then in the aftermath of 9-11, uh, the association of Islam with terror has brought a very mixed situation in the recognition both of the power, but also the need to understand sympathetically religions that are not the religions uh, primarily of America or of Europe. And these struggles continue on, whether we're talking about the issue of how young women dress in the schools in France, or a host of other issues, the, the cartoons that appeared in Denmark, we are at a time when religion is inescapable. The question is, will we understand those religions on a global scale in a way that is sympathetic, is complex, and is textured? Or will the understanding of religion be driven by forces that are outside either the study of religion or the practice of religion. That's the way I think I would characterize or, or, or set the context for uh, the kinds of considerations that we're going to be talking about in this panel. Let me talk just about three dimensions of the, of the issue of religion in public affairs. The importance of religion in politics, of religion in society, and of religion in culture. And then I was su want to suggest some questions that I think are absolutely essential for a place like the Divinity School and for the study of religion in the university, if we are to be helpful, if we're to respond to the kind of challenge that President Bach set before us. Probably the field that has had the greatest long standing in the university, and, and even so, Madeleine Albright's uh, witness last night is a reminder of how relatively recent this is, is the field of religion and politics. It's a well established field in the study of religion, and it is a field that has um, uh, has at least a foothold in important fields like government and political science. Certainly some of the people we associate with the Divinity School faculty have long been concerned with the question of religion and politics. Brian Hare, whose interest in just war and the ethics of international relations. David Little, whose work in human rights has been so important. My own work in religion and American public life. Francis Fiorenza's new work on theology and the question of human rights. This has been a long established field in the university and an important strength in the divinity school. Even so, it has been difficult for people in the study of religion to try to set the context or to set the nature of the questions for those other fields to consider. 
I have spent almost all of my life in the university working in collaborative relationships with other persons in other disciplines. I've been a fellow in three different um, centers at the university, two of them at the, at the Kennedy School and most recently the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs. And it is clear to me that for most people in most fields there is an instrumental attitude towards religion. That is, people want to know just enough about religion to continue to work on the agendas that they have established in their own fields. The question is, can we create forms of relationship in which we are equal dialogue partners to people in government and political science who work in the field of politics? I think we're not yet there. I think we've made great progress. Second, religion and society. This is a field that was virtually um, pioneered and established at Harvard Divinity School through the work of James Luther Adams. Jim Adams understood the importance of social theory and of sociology for the understanding of theology and of religion. And he really did pioneer the creation of the field of religion and society in uh, religious studies and in theology. In today's world, there is a great interest in the phenomenon of the social movement. Because the social movement is often a countercultural and counterpolitical form that religion takes internationally. And so it is, a, it is a counterpoint to those who associate religion always with the maintenance of the status quo, or who relate religion always and only with the, a kind of conservative resistance to movements forward. Social movements, particularly those who are inspired by religion, often have radical, resisting, um, and even revolutionary effects in their society. And increasingly, nationally and internationally, there is attention to social movements in religion and society. One of the challenges, I think, at Harvard Divinity School is how we will keep this field alive in light of the fact that we have not had, either in the sociology department or in the study of religion, since Robert Bella in the 1970s, someone who works primarily in social theory and in the sociology of religion. An important field for Harvard's past, an important field for Harvard's future. Third, religion and culture. As Bill said in his remarks this morning, one of the most exciting things, in my judgment, about the last five to six years is the way in which Harvard has diversified its resources in a variety of religions uh, and in a variety of approaches to the study of religion. We now have a number of people on the faculty who are historians who have borrowed and who use effectively anthropological methods. We have people like Michael Jackson, who is himself an anthropologist, now working in the area of the anthropology of religion. And we have people working in the field of ethics across a range of religious traditions. My two colleagues, Ammonius, Don Swearer, both teach ethics in the context of their religious traditions. Uh, Janet Gyatso teaches in the context of Buddhism. Jonathan Schofer does so in the context of, of Judaism. So we have really emerging strength in the, in the area of ethics across religious traditions. What we have not yet done, and I think one of the challenges that Bill has set before us for the next few years, is how to organize these uh, ways of thinking about ethics across these religious traditions to lift up the program in ethics at Harvard and in the study of religion more generally. So both at the Divinity School and in the study of religion. And one of the things that one has to learn from this new process is that there is a different way of thinking about ethics in traditions outside of Christianity and Judaism, which has to be integrated into our understanding of ethics as a field within religion and culture. I think it is an extraordinarily exciting moment for Harvard, but it, it, it also invites us to some very difficult intellectual work, which is, I think, on the agenda for the next five to six years. Finally, some challenges. The first challenge is the one that I've already identified, and that is to resist the instrumentalization of the study of religion in the university. And for that, the Divinity School and the study of religion need to be equal partners with our colleagues in government, in sociology, and in the other fields in the social sciences and the humanities at Harvard. Secondly, to get people who are interested in religion in those other disciplines to take seriously the full richness and complexity of religious traditions. 
And for us to challenge the analytical categories which they bring from their own fields to the study of religion. So we need to invite them into the richness of religious traditions, but we also need to engage them in a serious critical conversation about the very analytical categories we use to, to study and to analyze religion. That's a second major challenge. Then thirdly, to build resources at Harvard Divinity School and in the study of religion to meet the current moment of opportunity that I think um, President Bach so clearly uh, set before us. This is a moment of extraordinary promise at Harvard University in the study of religion. And we need to marshal the resources here at the Divinity School and in the study of religion more generally in order to meet this moment of opportunity. I think it's a wonderful time to be at Harvard. It's a wonderful time to have all of you in partnership uh, with this effort. And we're going to talk a little bit now about one of the efforts that I think is a pioneering effort that has begun in this last year, and that is our program in business across religious traditions. In May, we will have the third of a series of presenta presentations on the religious traditions of the world and the question of business or the economy in those traditions. I really believe that we are modeling a new way of raising the issues of ethics in the context of religious traditions through this program. We began by looking at the religions of China in a meeting in New York this fall. And Monius then presented this winter in New York on the religions of South Asia and particularly of India. And Don Swearer is going to make a presentation at the Charles Hotel in May about uh, Buddhism and Southeast Asia. Then next year we will have three uh, succeeding sessions on Islam, on Judaism, and on Christianity. So we are moving now in an area that has had relatively little attention at the university, that is on religion and the economy and religion and business. And we are setting the terms of the discussion and inviting our colleagues in business to listen to us and engage in conversation with us. Again, I think this is an exciting beginning of what I think is a new era in the study of religion and at the Divinity School at Harvard. So I'll now move to Anne to talk to you a little bit about her presentation and about the program on business across religious traditions. Thanks very much, Ron, and thank all of you for being here this morning. It's wonderful to see so many of you here. Um, and I'll speak just briefly, uh, basing my comments on the case study that I presented at the BART or Business Across Religious uh, Traditions Seminar in New York. When it comes to India and religion, there are two very, very different stereotypes or caricatures, I would say, out there in the public media in the public square in America. One of them dates back to the colonial enterprise and the construction of India, if you've read your Marx, uh, as a backward, somewhat less progressive country because it is mired in religion. Everything, this is what got me into the study of India in the first place. I read all of those books that you read in high school, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, Siddhartha, all of those things. And I pictured everyone in India sort of wandering around with palm leaf manuscripts uh, in Sanskrit. It was a little bit shocked when I got to India after college to find out that that was not the case. So we had this image of India steeped in religious traditions, that everything in India somehow always comes back to religion. On the other hand, uh, we have the phenomenon of the globalizing economy in India. Uh, India, which opened its, threw open its doors to foreign investment in unprecedented ways, first in 1992, has grown exponentially. Its foreign economy, its national economy has grown exponentially in the 15 years since, as it's called economic liberalization. Um, in fact, within the next 10 years, it's predicted that India will overtake Japan to become the world's third largest economy uh, after the United States and China. The case study that I focused on, uh, however, uh, so we have this image, before I go into that, we have this image of India as this economic giant that has yielded a recent book title, I don't know if you've seen it in your local bookstore, about India's current economic boom called In Spite of the Gods. So that somehow this economic boom and religion are two different things at war with each other. The case study that I chose to focus my remarks on in New York uh, in February dealt with one of the latest uh, controversies about the new global economy in India, namely the introduction of genetic, genetically modified crops and seeds into the agricultural sector. 
Uh, Monsanto, through its Indian subsidiaries, Monsanto, I'm sure you know, is a St. Louis-based American company, multinational company, uh, began testing through its Indian subsidiaries a variety of uh, genetically modified seeds, particularly one known as BT cotton. The BT simply stands for the bacillus uh, that is said to naturally protect against the boll weevil, boll weevil infestation. Uh, sale of BT cotton <coughs> seed was uh, legalized in 2002. Uh, in 2006, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, uh, and so in March of last year, a year ago, and President Bush signed an Indo-US knowledge uh, and practice initiative <coughs> in agriculture to promote more genetically modified seeds, different kinds of agricultural practices. Uh, but the furor over the introduction of largely just at this point genet genetically modified or GM cotton uh, has been such that the Indian Supreme Court in October of last year actually banned any further testing of genet genetically modified edible foodstuffs. So cotton is still grown, but <coughs> testing, further testing of anything actually consumable, edible, uh, has been banned. Now, the reason for this furor, uh, or the reasons are primarily two, I would argue. One of them has received a great deal of media attention, both in India and abroad, and applies not only to the use of genetically modified seeds in South Asia, but also around the world, and that is the financial impact on subsistence level farmers who use genetically modified seed. Um, India is a land, again, of tremendous wealth and a growing middle class, but it's estimated that 650 million farmers own less than two acres or own no land at all. So you have roughly 650 million subsistence level farmers. What has created such tremendous uh, hardship for those who have been in many ways, um, there are a lot of uh, accusations back and forth, but for those who have endeavored to use genetically modified seed based on the promise that it holds, of meat requiring less pesticide, greater yields, has been tremendous. Monsanto sells genetically modified cotton seeds in India that are sterile. They do not reproduce. So that in times of uh, low crop yield or crop failure, there aren't even any seeds uh, to be salvaged for the next planting. This has created, simply in the five years since the sale of seed became legal, an unbearable cycle of debt for subsistence level farmers. They go into debt to buy the first round of seed. Uh, the crops don't fail or they don't yield, uh, as Monsanto has promised, and they don't have seed for the next planting. They have to go further into debt. The most conservative estimate is that 40,000 subsistence level cotton farmers have committed suicide in India since 2002, um, simply unable to see any way out of this growing cycle of debt. This has, again, uh, this is a story that has been told and retold in the media throughout much of the developing world in Africa, in Latin America, where uh, genetically modified corn has yielded similar results. What has not gotten an enormous amount of attention, however, really any attention in the American media and scant attention even in the India, say, English language dailies that circulate outside of India and in the Indian diaspora in this country have been the cultural and religious factors that have, create, have truly generated much of the controversy about genetically modified crops as well as absolutely been the source of grassroots resistance to these movements uh, or to this uh, new kind of agricultural production. Now, genetically modified food have, I'm sure you know, produced some stir in this country. Vegetarians have been extremely worried uh, that animal genes are used to manipulate products and therefore they might be eating uh, agricultural uh, vegetables, for example, that have been somehow modified with animal genes. There have been a lot of health concerns, uh, a lot of studies about potential risks to animal health. In the case of India, however, with a very, very different view of the substantive material world, genetically modified crops, crops particularly edible foods, create all kinds of challenges um, and in fact are deeply, deeply resisted um, 
some of the, uh, where we see substance as morally neutral, we think the table's the table, and Ron's Ron, and Don's Don, and I'm Ann, and we're all discrete bodily units. <coughs> Most, uh, and this is not simply Hindu, but South Asians culturally, imbue the material world with all sorts of substantive values. Um, I often think of looking at substance in India, it's like looking at the white wall in the back that's blank, and then all of a sudden seeing it with these myriad colors and codes that we somehow have to interact with. Some of these kinds of qualities of the material world have gotten a bad, bad press, we might say, even in introductory Hinduism textbooks. One of the qualities imbued uh, in the material world is, for example, factors of purity and pollution something that determines the nature of human bodies, the nature of foodstuffs, the nature of the world, the trees, everything that's substantive has a factor of purity or pollution, which determines in many ways the hierarchy of the caste system, something that um, most of us who've grown up in the United States have a rather difficult time getting our minds around. The material world is also imbued with qualities of uh, we might call morality, some parts of the material world, including human bodies, including food, have qualities that make them more, we might say, intellectual. They're qualities of lightness. Other qualities that are qualities of dynamic energy. A different level of qualities, my favorite English translation of this one is moral torpitude. Uh, certain parts, you shouldn't eat certain foods because they contribute to a bodily sense of heaviness and inaction and lack of energy. All of the entire material world has these qualities. They are, in some ways, uh, per, uh, our bodies, everything in the material world is permeable. These qualities are transferable. This is, again, what has determined much of the social system we call caste, or think of as the caste system in this country. Who eats with whom? With whom do you allow your sons and daughters to marry? Like substances should cohere with like substances. One should eat those things, consume those things, mix with those people who most enhance those qualities that are innate to your body. So among the many things that genetically modified crops do in India is they do not fit into this world in any way. How do you, for example, take even a crossbred cow, say a Jersey Holstein or a Guernsey cow, and fit it into the system? The fact is, is that you can't fit it into the system. That genetic modification of foodstuff is completely foreign to this way of viewing the material world. So much so that the term used in vernacular resistance literature uh, in India today is a pejorative Sanskrit term called mlecha, which is a 3,000 year old term used to refer to those wholly outside the system. Of the, of the indigenous, indigenous cultural world view. Now, why is this important for a company like Monsanto to think about? There is no doubt that the Indian agricultural sector needs some assistance. 650 million very poor farmers getting poorer. Crop yields are down since the 1950s and 60s green revolution, so-called, which introduced fertilizers and pesticides. Crop yields are down. The Indian agricultural sector at this level certainly needs help. What can a company like Monsanto or any future uh, divinity school uh, NGO workers who go out and are interested in economic development learn from this kind of impasse really, not at the level simply of finance and debt, I'm not saying that's not important, but at a more fundamental basic level of what does it mean to be human if you are a Hindu or a Buddhist or a Jain or a Sikh living in India? What does it mean to have a body? How is that body affected by what you eat, the kinds of clothes you wear? People are reluctant to wear clothes made out of genetically modified cotton because they claim, in the vernacular, again, literature, grassroots resistance, to this that it doesn't feel right on the skin, that it changes all kinds of elements of your sort of surface level body. And these things are to be taken very seriously. One of the things that Monsanto has to learn, I would argue, is how even to talk to the grassroots resistance movements that have sprung up all over India. Um, one of the most important, known as Navdanya, which really means nine seeds, is headed by an American-trained biophysicist named Vandana Shiva, 
who sits on a variety of global, uh, uh, global, global consumer advocacy groups alongside Ralph Nader, for example. And she has been trying very, very hard to come up with a language that Monsanto can understand taking this very complex view of the material world and translating it into the scientific language of biodiversity. Uh, much of the resistance has also take on explicit, has taken on explicitly Gandhian overtones, religious overtones very much, uh, in a Hindu context, of thinking about the relationship between what we might think of as discrete entities, issues of biodiversity, economic development, religious worldview, and even ritual. Vandana Shiva has taken it upon, and her group have taken it upon herself, uh, for example, to try to resurrect a variety of biodiversity uh, enhancing ritual practices, such as agricultural festivals, where seeds are exchanged from village to village, which ultimately allows for uh, a certain amount of diversity of seed production and pollination. She's trying to resurrect those which have died in the wake of the introduction of ge genetically modified seeds because no one knows how to classify them. These have been completely left out of agricultural rituals. So to, to look at the cultural implications of something like genetic modification of crops is not merely to say that Monsanto is bad and that uh, biodiversity or religious culture is good, something that people, as I'm a historian of religion, are often, I think, accused of. Well, you just don't care about business, so you don't know anything about economics. In fact, it's absolutely necessary, I would argue, to try to think about cultural and religious difference to begin to find common ground where, as we hope through these Business Across Religious Traditions seminars, business and culture, uh, the macro and the local in a globalizing economy can actually meet. Thanks, Anna. Uh, well, let me add my thanks to uh, all of you for coming and uh, spending time thinking about uh, the study of religion at Harvard and the Divinity School. Uh, some of the general uh, considerations that we're trying to bring before you, uh, which I think have been illustrated by our comments thus far, uh, is indeed the way in which we think about religion. Uh, not as uh, isolated sort of box off in the corner someplace, but in fact, something that permeates all of our lives in, in, in many, many respects. Uh, personal, social. Uh, the personal hasn't been mentioned very much yet, except Derek Bach, I think, spoke to that eloquently. Uh, the categories that Ron outlined, the political, the social, the culture, cultural, and then the way in which Anne illustrated this in terms of, uh, in terms of the Indian case. Um, Oftentimes, I think, at the Divinity School, we feel that uh, there's a misconception of people who uh, are not involved in religion, either in an academic or a scholarly way or as practitioners or in a personal way. They see it in um, a very sterile and isolated manner. So I think one of our purposes is, in fact, to not convince you necessarily, uh, but to illustrate by what we're saying, uh, namely that religion uh, is something that affects all of our lives in, uh, in a variety of very important ways. Uh, I think the term globalization uh, raises that question or that point of view uh, in a very dramatic way. Uh, I think superficially when we think about the term globalization, we probably think about it in more economic terms or political terms. Uh, we may think of the term globalization economically in terms of multinational corporations, uh, the develop of a, uh, development of a global economy. Uh, politically, we may think of globalization in terms of uh, international organizations like the United Nations and NATO and uh, perhaps the participation of nation states uh, in these organizations, but uh, nonetheless, this may be the kind of referencing that we do when we think about globalization uh, politically. But it's obviously the case that globalization profoundly affects uh, the way in which we understand ourselves, our identity as Americans, or I work in Thailand principally as Thais, as, as Indians. Um, so the effect of globalization uh, in 
cultural terms and religious terms as I think, as, as I think we know profound. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Anthony Giddens' work. Uh, one of his recent books called Runaway World addresses this dimension of globalization, if you will, the cultural dimension, the religious dimension, the identity dimension of globalization in these terms. <coughs> he says the battleground of the 21st century will pit fundamentalism against cosmopolitan tolerance. In a globalizing world where information and images are routinely transmitted across the globe, we are all regularly in contact with others who think differently and live differently from ourselves. Cosmopolitans welcome and embrace this cultural complexity. Fundamentalists find it disturbing and dangerous, whether in the areas of religion, ethnic identity, or nationalism, they take refuge in a renewed and purified tradition and quite often violence. So another aspect of globalization from this perspective that is very much in our face these days, I think, comes from this perspective. So do we think of globalization in terms of violence, uh, more specifically in terms of violence in the Middle East, uh, or the kind of, if you will, uh, violent uh, perhaps more verbal than, uh, than physical uh, confrontations that take place within our own communities or within our own, with our own traditions and cultures. Uh, this, I, in my view, gives uh, the kinds of things that we're talking about today either in the broad sense of how we understand religion in all aspects of our life or in, in, other, in other ways, uh, an urgency. And indeed, I would even say a moral imperative I think that institutions like Harvard, which are liberal, progressive, inclusive, uh, which uh, emphasize diversity and pluralism, um, have an exceptionally important role and mission to play in the world today. So I would like to add to the uh, general comments of Derek Bach about uh, the study and teaching of religion at Harvard, the more general comments. Uh, that Ron has made uh, and more specific illustrative comments that Anne has made, I would like to put before us, uh, if you will, uh, the kind of moral urgency, uh, the, the critical uh, uh, aspect of, 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 of these comments, uh, given the nature of the world in which we live today. Now, having said that and sort of made my sermonic pitch, uh, uh, my, my, uh, my assignment uh, in, 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 in the panel this morning is, talk, is to talk specifically about the center of the world, uh, Center for the Study of World Religions. Uh, <laughs> center of the world. It, it is. World. Is, <laughs> that, was, uh, that was an interesting <laughs> <laughs> in, in some of the ways in which I think um, we uh, at the center have... Uh, contributed to uh, the growth and development of the Divinity School in the direction of world religions and the study of religion, uh, world religions at Harvard. Uh, the center, if you, if you uh, are familiar with it, is actually a physical space. Uh, it's a building. It's a, a relatively low slung building, so you may not notice it across the street from the picture that was up here before this one was put up and overhaul. Uh, but if you haven't visited the center of the study of world religions, the center of the world, uh, I would urge you to, to, do, to do so. Uh, the center was established uh, by uh, GIFTS about 50 years ago now to promote the study of world religions at what was essentially at that point a Protestant seminary. Uh, the building itself was opened 46 years ago. We, uh, over the past year, have had various celebrations of the uh, 40, 45th anniversary of, of, of the founding of the center. Uh, if one looks at the language of the original deed of gift, namely to promote the study of world religions in various aspects at the Divinity School, I think we would say it has succeeded admirably. Uh, some of the ways in which that has happened have already been mentioned. Uh, Ron, for example, mentioned uh, the appointment of Michael Jackson uh, an anthropologist who works uh, in uh, Sierra Leone 
and among indigenous populations in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, appointments, uh, recent appointments in Islam, my own appointment in Buddhist studies, uh, Anne Monius doing Hinduism. Uh, so we could go on to illustrate the way in which the original gift, the deed of gift, and mission of the divinity of the center for the of the center of the world, the center of the study of world religions has succeed, has succeeded. Uh, Bill Graham himself, uh, in a sense, is indeed a product of uh, of that intention and of that gift. Uh, Diana Eck. And so we could look back at that older generation of folks who were appointed at the Divinity School, who have very much broadened uh, the study of religion at the Divinity School and at Harvard University. Indeed, the very establishment of a program in the study of religion at the university is very much, uh, has been very much linked with the center itself uh, during, the, uh, during the days when Wilfred Cantwell Smith was the director of the, of the, of the center. So uh, I think the center has had a a critical role, not just an important role, but a critical role to play in, uh, we might use the term globalization in a somewhat different way here, in terms of the globalization or the globalizing of the teaching and understanding of religion, not only in terms of traditions, but as Ron has mentioned and uh, Ammonius has illustrated, uh, the different methodologies and different approaches that we bring to our understanding and study of religion. I'd like to just take a couple of minutes uh, that I have left to talk more specifically about some of the um, kinds of things that we do at the center and the way in which I think uh, it ties in to uh, our consideration today and the comments that have been made. We do a great deal of thematic programming at the center. Uh, let me just mention some of those themes. Um, my first year here, I'm in my third year as director of the center. Uh, our theme the first year, apropos one of Ron's comments, uh, focused very much in the area of religion and politics, uh, religion and nationalism. Uh, one of the reasons that we wanted to do thematic program is that we, uh, programming is that we felt that this enhances the value of any individual program in regard to a particular theme. So we will, let's say, have a half a dozen of luncheon seminars or of afternoon panels that then culminate in a conference in the spring and eventuate in a publication. So that, for example, uh, the theme that first year on religion and politics and religion and nationalism uh, eventuated in a, uh, this conference and then a, a volume, Religion and Nationalism in Iraq, a Comparative Perspective. Uh, again, religion and politics, religion uh, engaging uh, one of the most volatile, uh, if you will, uh, areas of, uh, of the geopolitical severe today, uh, a very important way in which we are uh, trying to uh, look at religion as a part of uh, situations that uh, we think of more in terms of perhaps political terms, in terms of categories of violence. Uh, we not only looked at Iraq, we looked at it in comparative perspective, we looked at Bosnia, the Sudan, uh, and Sri Lanka as, as well. Uh, other themes that we have addressed programmatically, uh, the second year, which was last year, uh, we looked at the theme of religion and ecology or religion and the environment. Uh, we uh, had a conference in the spring in which we brought together a number of scholars from different humanistic perspectives. The overall intention here was, as Derek Bach suggested actually in some of his comments, the importance of humanistic perspectives on whatever endeavor we're talking about. In this case, it's the environment. Uh, as you know, uh, the environmental crisis has been labeled by many scholars as being the major crisis uh, of our age. If we cannot solve the environmental crisis, uh, we simply will not have a globe uh, uh, to live on very, uh, and very, very comfortably. That was a conference that we did with the Harvard, the center did with the Harvard University Center for the Environment. Uh, so again, apropos some of the comments that have been made, the way in which the Divinity School um, is intersecting with other segments of the university, Ron Thiemann's appointments at various institutes and centers at, the, at, at, at Harvard, uh, our work, joint work with the, uh, in this case, the Harvard University Center for the Environment. Our theme this year is uh, in authority and conflict in world religions. Uh, we talk about inter-religious conflict. But my goodness, let's look at intra-religious conflict. Uh, whether we talk about uh, uh, the liberal Christian voice versus the fundamentalist Christian voice in this country, 
whether we talk about Islamic fundamentalism or Hindu fundamentalism or progressive this and fundamental that. Uh, so uh, our focus this year has been more in terms of that intra uh, religious religious issues. So we're having a conference again this spring uh, that is looking, uh, as it were, beyond conflict at what we're calling visions of peace and, reconcili and reconciliation in world religions. Uh, we're beginning kicking this off with a, a, public, a public panel on peacemaking uh, from a world religions perspective. And then we brought together about 35 scholars and practitioners uh, to address these questions in terms of different religious traditions at the center. This is a conference that we're, uh, that we're, that we're doing with the Kroc Institute at Notre Dame, uh, with an institute of world religions uh, and conflict resolution uh, at another university and the uh, program and negotiation at the law school. So again, uh, again the university or the center as the center of the world, uh, we are a center that is reaching out uh, to other segments of the university and indeed beyond and globally. Um, so that uh, we sponsored a joint conference with Dongkuk University in Seoul, Korea on Buddhism and the environment, uh, for example. So uh, what, is, what does globalization mean as far as the Divinity School and the Center is concerned? Uh, it, it means uh, this, this kind of uh, connecting with various aspects of the world. I just received my uh, con I should conclude, uh, so let me just uh, conclude with just a, mentioning a couple of other aspects of the uh, work of the center uh, that touch upon the subject of, uh, of world religion and globalization. We're able to give a few faculty grants, uh, for example. Uh, people who have just recently received grants include Ron Thiemann himself to support his work uh, on religious leadership in Central Europe. Uh, Shahab Ahmed, uh, who's doing a study of madrasas in Pakistan. Uh, Jacob Alupona, who teaches uh, African religions at the Divinity School, uh, will be doing a study of IFA divination in West Africa and the African diaspora, uh, and, and, there, and there are a couple of others. But uh, since I've been commanded to stop, uh, I will respect that command, and uh, I hope I've given you, however, an idea. Uh, we've sort of come around from broad discussions to India and now uh, to the center of the world, which is the Center for the Study of World Religions. Uh, I hope we've given you an idea of the kinds of ways in which we're attempting to address these sorts of issues. Thanks, Tom. <clears throat> Before we have an opportunity for some interchange with you, there's one other very important matter um, that I want to, um, to introduce, and that is the, <clears throat> the program on business across religious traditions is the brainchild and is related to the vision of Bruce McEver. Bruce is here today, he's a member of the Dean's Council at the Divinity School. It was really his idea that spawned this new and very exciting program. Um, I've had the privilege of being the coordinator of the program and working closely with Bruce on trying to, to make this into an educational program. And I'd like to ask Bruce to come forward and just say a few words about this program and its importance uh, to the study of religion at, at the University. Bruce? Thank you. Um, is this one? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think some of these things come out of interest and they come out of naivety. Uh, <laughs> I, I've always been interested in uh, comparative religions, and um, naively, I think I thought during the crisis, the uh, Enron crisis and the ethics crisis, and I think those things still go on, that the, the divinity school would uh, have something to offer the business school and uh, naively wandered over to the business school and said, you know, maybe we could uh, have some co courses that crossed and uh, the business school said, you know, we really don't need that. Why don't you go see uh, Dean Graham? And um, so we started talking and uh, we came across, uh, we, we, I, I think I realized what a great resource this school is. Um, it's a debate as whether this is a leading resource in uh, the world religion of, of the knowledge of, of, of religions, or is it the resource? We debated that yesterday. But um, it is a great resource, as we see from this group that's gathered uh, in front of us. And I think the idea is to take this and, um, as the um, 
the Lord said, uh, take our light from under the bushel and put it on the hill and let it shine. And that's what we're trying to do with this BART program is take the knowledge that we have in this institution, the rich knowledge that we have, um, and um, teach initially um, the, we're trying to reach between the Harvard Divinity School and the Harvard Business School, but um, we are really, there, this, this can go a lot further. This can go across um, the Harvard alumni. This can go across um, all kind of other business uh, leadership groups, I think. Uh, we've had two uh, 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 sessions so far. Uh, we've got another exciting one coming up in May. And um, I think this thing uh, has some legs and uh, that we can use this uh, as an outreach program uh, really for Bill and the faculty here to uh, let the light of this great institution uh, shine and for us to do uh, some very important work, uh, in, at least initially in the business community in understanding um, these traditions. And we can all see how, you know, this knowledge is uh, extremely valuable. So the main thing that you can do in this room is we've got another session in May here in, uh, in, uh, in Boston. And, uh, you know, you all come and bring your friends. And uh, we're going uh, to have more of these in the following year. And thank you very much for all that you've done, Ron and Ann. And Don, I'm looking forward to your presentation in May. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. Tom, give us a couple questions. Yeah, okay. Well, I think we're already running a little bit behind on time, so we need to, to move along with just a couple of questions. Rich? Yeah. Um, I'm Richard Mao from Fuller Theological Seminary. I want to thank you. Uh, it's been extremely helpful, and, and I want to say that uh, what you're doing is really important to all of us. In the part of the religious world in which I spend my time, uh, the Anthony Giddens line about uh, fundamentalism versus uh, cosmopolitan tolerance uh, seems to describe a, a kind of politicizing of, of many of these issues. And uh, I really appreciated uh, Ron's call for a, a thicker, uh, a rich understanding of religion. And I think, Anne, uh, you've done that in a marvelous way. Uh, you know, if you think of, of our local issues, our, our, our so-called culture wars issues here, whether it's same-sex relations or abortion or uh, uh, stem cell research or religion in the schools, uh, we, we often politicize these issues in a way that I think you have anthropologized those in the, uh, in the Indian context, uh, taking very seriously uh, how very ordinary believers uh, understand their bodies and how they view seeds. And, and, and we don't often have that kind of sensitivity to both sides uh, of the debates here in North America where we simply reduce the whole thing to uh, a bunch of fundamentalists uh, arguing with a bunch of uh, cosmopolitan uh, tolerationists. And uh, I, I just want to say that what you folks are doing here in terms of uh, modeling how we can understand the thick significance of religion in uh, illuminating and really informing uh, both sides in, in these debates is very important for all of us. So thank you. Thanks, Rich. Please wait, wait in the back. I'm, I, I'm also blinded. Yes, please. This um, morning, I was so riveted by your, um, by your comments. Um, thanks very much. Um, Catherine Kurz, end of 86 year professor of religious studies at Eugene Lang of the New School University. Um, I'd like to um, ask you, in the terms of genetic modification, you're really talking about. Um, kind of a confusion or a rupture of categories that make life possible. Right. Um, so sort of with that in mind, I'm wondering, um, you know, have there been any um, conversations, for example, um, within India, the people who are involved um, in the cleanup of, the, of Ganga, um, who understand hydraulic engineers, the public health, um, people who understand Ganga um, both as um, sacred um, and as need of cleanup. So it's a kind of a both and rather than either or. Mm -hmm. And uh, part two, wondering whether there have been any conversations of looking at both um, intra and inter religious kinds of uh, conversations and engagement, whether there have been any of that sort of thing um, with, for example, the, um, the uh, observant 
a Jewish world that also has a worldview of um, uh, permeability, the whole kind of uh, eco kashrut um, mm -hmm. movement, you know, kind of what goes with what, what you don't put next to what. Right. So right. Those are both very good questions, and I actually sort of teach whole classes answering <laughs> both of them, so I'll be very brief. Um, on the issue of environmentalism, um, on the Ganga, the holy river that flows through North India in particular, it's been very interesting. There has to, to date been a real impasse between local communities and the kind of governmental efforts to clean up the river. And that is largely for the kinds of religious beliefs that surround the river anthropomorphized as Mother Ganga, a goddess. And there are two, there's a, a conception then of the river as, well, she'll take care of herself. Um, and so finally, there's a government program that's using, using the rhetoric of Mother Ganga is ailing, which has had some more success in getting local attention in terms of thinking, taking very uh, carefully and directly the idea that she is, in fact, a divine being. The other issue is one uh, that we often don't think about in ethics at all, and that is constructions of time or temporality. In the Hindu view of the world, we live in a time where it's called the Kali Yuga, the age of blackness, um, in which dharma or ethics, moral possibility is broken, our horizons of Moral perfection are very, very limited. And so the biggest uh, concern, or there have been numerous studies by Western anthropologists wondering why locals don't want to clean up the Ganga, and the comment is always the same. It's the Kali Yug. You know, things are going to get worse before they get better. So both of these things, I would say in the last two years, there's a new study that's going to come out. What again, as I was saying about Monsanto, what seems to work is for the scientific community, the government agencies, to take this seriously and to begin to forge what is essentially a new language for understanding things like environmental cleanup. On the issue of intra-religious dialogue, um, I would have to say that there was a real stymie put on that in India um, when the BJP, the Hindu Fundamentalist Party or Hindu Nationalist Party, was in power uh, between 1998 and 2004. Um, that has begun to change a bit. India is 85% Hindu, um, and so the, I, I would say that Hindu communities are still recovering in some ways from uh, the sort of complete lack of any sort of interest or forum. Um, things in India tend to be very local. The effective measures are always local, dealing with specific problems and specific issues, and over those specifics you always see different groups of different religious persuasions able to come together at some level. But nationally, very, very little dialogue of this sort going on right now, I would say. Thanks, Anne. We're already running behind, so we're going to have to bring this to a close. Again, thanks for your attention. In, in show business, there's a, there's a phrase, always leave and want more. Um, so we hope you will want more. And a reminder that in May, the, uh, the Business Across Religious Traditions will meet here at the Charles Hotel. And then next year, three uh, sessions in New York City. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much.